Hi, and welcome to Faith Track. We have been exploring what it means to be a disciple and how the term disciple is just another word for dedicated student. So as we seek to follow Jesus with intention and dedication, we become his disciples. In this module on devotion, we seek to grow as disciples in our devotion to God, which is a commitment to continually deepen our relationship with God and orient our lives around that priority. In our time together, we will look at a good number of passages from the Bible, and I will encourage you to take what we discuss into conversations with others. For this, we have created a notes page with all of the Bible verses and discussion questions. You can access the notes page at the link shown on the screen and in the chat. In our last episode, we explored how we can know God through Jesus the Son. In this episode, we are going to explore another important aspect of knowing God, God the Spirit. As students of Jesus and people who are seeking to understand and apply what Jesus taught, there's something missing from the lives of many believers today. As we read through the Gospels, we see Jesus referring to the important role that the Holy Spirit would play in the lives of his disciples. As we read through the letters of the churches, or to the churches and, and the communities of the New Testament, we see their strong reliance and dependence upon the Holy Spirit as an active part of their daily lives. For many of us, God the Father feels relatable because there are fathers around that we can look to and see what a father can or should be. And we can step into the invitation to be his children. God the Son is relatable because Jesus came as a human and lived a life similar to ours and interacted with normal, imperfect people. However, God the Holy Spirit who dwells in us, this is different. This is unique. I remember when I first heard about the, the Holy Spirit of the Holy Ghost, I kind of envisioned something between Casper the Friendly Ghost, and if you're too young to know Casper the Friendly Ghost, you can Google him, um, but somewhere between Casper the Friendly Ghost and the comfort I felt as a child when I imagined my deceased father being by my side to kind of maybe looking out for me. But this is real, and, and God, the Spirit. So part of knowing God and understanding him in ourselves is understanding God, the Holy Spirit, and how he works in us and with us. The Holy Spirit is the third part of our understanding of God's triune nature, which we will cover in future episodes on theology. For our purposes here, it is worth noting that we are, or as we read the Bible, it is clear that the Holy Spirit played a major part in the workings of God throughout creation, history, and the lives of Jesus, the disciples, and the early church. As we have explored discipleship, we have often looked at the Great Commission in Matthew 28, in which Jesus gave the, the core assignment to those who would follow him to go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that he, Jesus, had commanded. If this is the assignment of all who would profess his identity, embrace his teachings, and follow him with our lives, then the natural question arises, how are we going to be able to do this? To know, remember, and teach all that he commanded. In our episode focusing on God the Father, we, we looked at John chapter 14 when Jesus had said to his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And we walked through the fact that we can know, learn a lot about the character, intentions, and nature of God the Father through looking at his son, Jesus. In that very same chapter of John's gospel, Jesus began to teach his disciples extremely important things about the role and identity of the Holy Spirit. In John 14 verses 15 to 17, Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. The apostle Paul also wrote of the spirit's presence in his letter to the Romans in Romans 8 verses 9 through 11. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If the, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. The spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So we can know here that we can grow in our devotion to God as we recognize and celebrate that the Holy Spirit dwells within all disciples. So the Holy Spirit's presence should be discernible in the lives of disciples of Jesus. But it's worth asking how this happens. What does the Spirit, or when does the Spirit come in? This is a bit of a tricky question because it varies. Like many things with God, we cannot s simply put the Spirit's arrival, presence, and full manifestation in a box. For some, the Spirit comes powerfully at the profession of belief. This actually happened for me. I proclaimed my desire to follow and honor Jesus as Lord and live my life accordingly. And I immediately sensed the Spirit's presence in me, even though I didn't fully understand at the time what that meant. In Acts 10, Peter received a vision and had gone to the home of Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion, but he was also a man who believed in and prayed to God. 
It's a powerful story and following the Holy Spirit's leading, Peter shared the good news of Jesus dying for all people's sins and rising from the dead. And the house full of Gentiles, non-Jewish people believed. Then we see in Acts 10, 44 to 47, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised, the, the Jews, who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? For other people, it, it happens after baptism. In Acts 2, Peter spoke to the crowd that had come after hearing the disciples speaking in many different languages after they had received the Holy Spirit. Peter shared what had happened with Jesus' death and resurrection. The crowd was moved with conviction, repented and asked what to do. In Acts 2, 38 to 39, and Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For, this, for the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord God calls to himself. Peter guided the people to turn from the things that separate them from God and step into their belief by being baptized and then assured them that the Holy Spirit would be given to them. Thus, some people receive the Spirit after belief, repentance, and baptism, or at least during that process. And sometimes people may also not fully receive the Spirit immediately. In these situations, we can ask and invite others to pray. In Luke 11, we can read that Jesus said, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then who are evil in our brokenness compared to God, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God wants us to have his Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And sometimes we need only ask, but let's not forget inviting the Holy Spirit to dwell in us is inviting him to become a part of every aspect of our lives. He will begin the process of transforming and redeeming all parts of our lives, which inevitably changes things, especially us. We don't receive the Spirit and then rest as in no longer having to contend for how we live our lives. We receive the Spirit and then we move with him. And finally, People may not realize the Holy Spirit is available based on other people's beliefs or lack of understanding. In Acts 19 verses 1 through 6, we read, And it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples and he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, No, we have not even heard that there's a Holy Spirit. And he said, Into what then were you baptized? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Je the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. At times, people may be baptized before understanding, now often as an infant or a young child, or baptized into repentance, but not into belief and identifying with Jesus or being in our identity in Jesus. In Acts 19, the baptism in, in Jesus followed by the laying on of hands led to fully receiving the Holy Spirit. So here we can see we can grow in our devotion to God as we embrace the Holy Spirit as God's gift to us, as his very presence in us to help guide and equip us in our lives as disciples. The primary thing to know is that God, the Holy Spirit, is available to all disciples. He comes into our lives in different ways, but we can benefit from his presence as we align with God's will and live according to Jesus' teaching. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, uses slightly different language for the same phenomenon when he wrote in Ephesians 1, 13-14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, our, our inheritance, to the praise of his glory. Another word for guarantee is down payment, as if God, the Holy Spirit, has come to reside in us as a down payment of our full redemption and salvation in Christ. We experience a taste of God's love, presence, and power, which later we will receive when we dwell with him forever. Among the many surprising aspects of new life in Christ, one of the richest and most mysterious is that the third member of the Trinity actually comes to reside within each and every believer as a guide, teacher, comforter, equipper, interpreter, 
inspiration, revealer, and so much more. The believer is never alone because God himself came as the Holy Spirit and resides within each believer and thus is very close and ready to assist us in our lives with him. Hence, calling him the comforter makes sense. And it is the Spirit who makes our calling as disciples possible. Jesus continued about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 26. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. That question that we asked earlier, how can we possibly teach all that Jesus commanded and said? The answer is right here in John 14, 26. The Spirit will teach and bring to remembrance all that is needed. So we see that we can grow in our devotion to God as we learn from the Holy Spirit who opens our eyes and hearts to truth and brings to our memory things that we have learned from God and his word. This is powerful, but sometimes it still seems distant. Given the choice, most of us would rather say that we'd prefer to have Jesus alongside of us rather than the Spirit in us. However, Jesus, as he was preparing his disciples for his death, resurrection, and ascension back to the Father said this in John 16, verses 7 and 8. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I did not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Part of the role of the Spirit will be to bring conviction to people who are separated from God. The Spirit prepares their hearts to hear the good news as his disciples share what Jesus said and did. And further explaining how this could be better than Jesus being here himself, he had said earlier in that evening, in John 14, verses 12 to 14, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these he will do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Jesus said it was better that he left so that the Holy Spirit would come and dwell in all of his disciples who could then be empowered to do even greater things than he did. Did you hear that? Greater things than he did, than Jesus did. What does that even look like? We get glimpses of what this could mean when when the likes of Billy Graham, who sometimes would see tens of thousands of people give their lives to the Lord in one simple sharing of the gospel. If we take Jesus at his word, and I think we should, We, his disciples, have access to the ability to do great things in order to glorify God. The key is to be empowered and guided by the Spirit. With great power comes great responsibility. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. How we live matters. What we say and don't say, what we do and don't do, we can honor and glorify God and invite His Spirit to utilize us to do great things for Him. Or we can squander our entrustment. We can silence His Spirit in us. Sometimes our comfort limits our sensitivity and willingness to respond to the Comforter. May we be ready to move into the great things He may want to speak to and through us and the great works He can do through those who are willing. We will close this with a great encouragement from Paul in his letter to the Thessalonians, his first letter to the Thessalonians in in chapter 5, verse 16 to 24, in the message version. Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you who belong to Christ Jesus to live. Don't suppress the Spirit and don't stifle those who have a word from the Master. On the other hand, don't be gullible. Check out everything and keep only what's good. Throughout anything tainted with evil. May God himself, the God who makes everything holy and whole, make you holy and whole. Put you together, spirit, soul, and body, and keep you fit for the coming of our master, Jesus Christ. The one who called you is completely dependable. If he said it, he'll do it. Let's not stifle the Spirit. Let's welcome in the Holy Spirit of God who will help and guide us, equip us, and strengthen us to do great things for God's glory. As we stay filled with His loving presence, His Spirit will lead us back when we do stumble and and sin. He will equip us with spiritual gifts for the building up of this community of believers and guide us in applying the teaching of His Word. We can grow in our devotion to God as we worship God through our lives as temples, homes of his Holy Spirit. 
As I mentioned in our last session, with, with, with each of these lessons in devotion, in the devotional model, module, the devotion module, I will challenge each of us to try a devotional approach for a week. And most of these will take five minutes of our day, but can be a simple method to connect with God intentionally. So far, we have started a journal and applied the practice of Lectio Divina. This week, I'd like to introduce a simple practice, listening for the Spirit. So devotional challenge number three, listening for the Spirit. So let's continue to journal, and this week, let's just jot down some notes as you ask three questions, and then there's a fourth step as well. So we're asking three questions to the Holy Spirit, and then listening for a response. And note, the Holy Spirit sometimes feels like our conscience. So if this is a new process for, for you, make note of what you're sensing. So step one, stop. Is there anything that I'm doing that you are asking me to surrender or stop doing? Two, Start, is there anything that you are asking me to start doing in order to align with or glorify you? Three, serve. Is there anything that you are wait, wanting me to do today to serve you or others? And finally, four, scripture. Test what you are hearing against scripture and trusted fellow disciples or leaders. And this fourth step is important because sometimes what we're starting to hear isn't necessarily the spirit in us. And so we want to make sure that what we're doing is aligning with God's word. And that's how we test the spirit to make sure that we're moving with him. Remember that the spirit dwells in all, in all believers. Sometimes we just need to learn to listen for his voice, remove obstacles, or even take some small steps. These steps might include repenting from going astray or getting baptized if you haven't been or baptized without understanding. If you have questions about how to draw near to God, you can always email info at cornerstonesf.org and we will help you to take the next step. I'd love to pray and then we will hop over to our Zoom conversation. Before I do that though, if, if you are watching this after its original airing or if you're unable to join us for the conversation part of tonight, this is meant to be gone through in community. Faith trackers or disciples always walk things out at least in pairs. So join us for the conversation if you can or find another person or group of people to embark on this journey together. Our primary goal is that these teachings would be a tool that can help us dig into these key areas of growth as disciples of Jesus, but also be a place in which we can ask questions and grow as we move together as a community. So let's pray. So Lord, I, I thank you that you have given us your spirit to dwell in us. I ask that you would guide us into the things that, that will help us to take hold of you more. Lord, may we see your spirit moving in and through us, not to, to just reassure us of our faith, Lord, but to, to do things that are beyond our ability, just our, our physical ability, our skills, Lord, but that, that your very work would be done through us. You said it was greater that you, Lord Jesus, would, would leave so that the spirit could come and dwell in every single believer, thereby multiplying the effect and touch of, of you through the lives of all believers across the world. So no longer would, would your touch be confined to one location where you were bodily, but through your spirit, where every believer is, you can move and transform lives, set people free and, and bring healing and the hope of life forever. And so Lord, I pray that you would equip us through your spirit to um, remember your teaching, Lord, to, to, that you would bring to remembrance as we share your love and life with others. And be in our conversations as well. Guide us to the truth that you want us to take hold of this week. Help us to hear as we practice listening to you. And I just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I hope you can enjoy us for the conversation. If not, let's keep these conversations going. And we'll see you next week. God bless.